Hey, it's Mara from Matter Hackers. Welcome to our inspiration session, starting your Etsy shop with 3D printing. This is a very special panel because there are so many Matter Hackers customers out there who are passionate about 3D printing and are making amazing things and are wondering how to make that leap into entrepreneurship and start their own business. Well, we have gathered some pros who have done just that. Meredith from Sugar Dash, Barrett from Porta Keeper, and Peter from Villainous Prop Shop are going to tell us how they started their Etsy shops and share some tips and tricks that have made their businesses successful. This panel is also great for educators. So if your students are making custom designs and 3D printing them, or if you're looking for a reason to bring 3D printers into your entrepreneurship program in your school, you're all in the right place. Enjoy being inspired by our panel. Cool. All right. Meredith Parnell is uh, our first panelist. Um, her Hi. cookie cutter Etsy shop is called Sugar Dash Co. It boasts over 5,000 sales and 461 listings. We're going to talk about that. That seems like a really lot of listings. Um, she's a photographer, video editor, and an avid baker. And during the pandemic, she became a stay-at-home mom and created this Etsy business. And we're going to put everybody's links in the chat as well so you can check them out. Hi, Meredith. Thanks for being here. Hi, Mara. Thanks for having me. And then we've got uh, Barnett Ellis with Porta Keeper. Um, it is a diverse Etsy shop that specializes in espresso and archery, which are two things that should always really be together. Bring her in. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, 1,293 sales last time I checked and five listings. Um, he's actually an engineer. And I love that he's introducing his four and a half year old daughter to 3D printing. Good to see you back. Yeah, I'll see you. And, and then we also have Peter Schneider, Villainous Prop Shop. Uh, they design helmets, masks, and other prop items from popular comic books, films, and video games. We are all in the company of super nerds here. It's fantastic. Over 8,000 sales, <laughs> almost 200 listings. Um, and what's fascinating about Pete's business, spoiler alert, is that uh, he uses a network of other people with 3D printers across the country to create this localized distributed manufacturing model. So we're going to hear a lot more about that. Hi, Peter. Hi, how you doing? Nice to see you. Okay, cool. So um, we'll maybe just kind of go in the same order um, and I'll ask a few questions. Everybody can give their answers. Um, you know, the, the thing that I love about virtual, you know, vir virtual panels are great, but um, what I actually love about in-person panels is there's a lot of like panelists kind of talking to each other and asking questions. So that is all on the table. And um, for our audience, uh, I mentioned earlier, we do have a Q&A set uh, like uh, um, icon on the bottom of your Zoom. So if you would please use the Q&A for your questions. We do have the chat if you want to make a comment or something, then you know you can use the chat. But we're not going to be looking for questions in the in the uh, chat because the chat just kind of goes up and up and we can't find them. So please put questions into the Q&A icon and we will be coming to those um, at the end of the panel. So uh, Meredith, we'll start with you. Tell me a little bit okay. about your background and um, I mean, how you how you've come to be on this panel today. All right. Uh, so my background is in video editing and photography. I also have a background in design. So it was like you said, when uh, the pandemic hit, all of my photography and video editing jobs tried up for the moment. And I had my three-year-old daughter at home with me, I guess two and a half at the time. And I knew the jobs would come back, but there was, I just wanted to find something else to do just to bring in a little bit of income. And I was making uh, some cookies and I was cutting them by hand and that really sucked. And then I found out that you can make them. And when I found out you could do it with a 3D printer, I've always wanted one. So I just hopped on it. So when did you get your first 3D printer? I got my first 3D printer last July. Wow. So it's been less than a year. Less than a year. And you've got this successful business mm -hmm. already up and running where you're designing literally hundreds of designs. Yes. Amazing. Um, cool. All right. Well, we're going to come back and, uh, and get more details on that. Um, Barrett, how about you, your background and kind of how you started your business and got here today? Yeah, for sure. Uh, I'm an engineer by background. So I spent a lot of time in college designing stuff. We design 
parts as part of the curriculum and learning how to do drawings. And that's really what I do for a living is design stuff for people. So it just kind of turned something that I enjoy at work into a hobby. And a friend of mine, he's in the aircraft industry. We actually started this together. We just bought a printer together that we could share. And we had an idea of something that we wanted to do and it just didn't come to fruition. It was just, it, it ended up being pretty expensive to produce, but we just kept finding the need for more and more things. It's like, man, this would make my life easier. This would make my life easier. And it's turned into a business. That's awesome. So really making a business out of problem solving. Yeah. Which is, you know, kind of what 3d printers are good for. Definitely. Very cool. Peter, how about you? Oh, uh, yeah. Um, so um, I'm a, well, I'm chemist. Uh, I work at a pharmaceutical company. Um, so this has nothing to do with my job. Um, how it started was I wanted a uh, Star Wars mask. And instead of buying the mask, I thought, hey, I can design it myself and 3D print it. And that's how I got started. I taught myself how to design stuff through YouTube videos. I had no background in engineering or anything like that. And just taught myself how, how to do it um, and then 3D printed it. And actually, I made the mask. Um, and from there, my wife's like, you enjoy this. Why don't you start, you know, selling some of your stuff? Because I started making more and more designs and sharing them on, on Thingiverse. So that's how I started. I started just sharing files of masks and helmets I made. And then I started uh, selling them on Etsy. And so now that's what I do now. I start selling them. And that's the, uh, now I part, only do part-time work as a, as a chemist and I do this more full-time. Oh. So. Now it's, I find it so interesting. And I think a question that we get a lot is how do you know when it's time or what for you, what made you cross over from doing this as a hobby and for fun and like posting things on Thingiverse or something into making that decision to actually start a business? Well, well, for me, um, it was just the this people were just kept on asking for more and more and more. And then they started like, well, I, I really don't know how to 3D print or my 3D printer can't print that. Is there any way you can print this for me? So I'm like, oh, yeah, sure, I can print it. And then, you know, I, I had to figure out an organized way of doing this. And that's where Etsy came in the play where I could start just posting pictures of, of the, the helmets I made and start selling them there. It just it happened. And you know, I really enjoyed designing. Like I, I've made hundreds of helmets. I don't even share, like I'll make a helmet sometimes and then just never look at it again, just cause I like doing it. So, but yeah. And I, you know, I, at, at first it was just to pay for the supplies. And, and then I started noticing that I was doing well enough that it was paying more than just the supplies. So. How about you, Meredith? Um, I, got into it. The whole reason I bought the 3d printer was to start a business. And I knew that the overhead was going to be low to start. And if it worked out great. And if it didn't, it was okay. And I didn't lose that much. Um, so it just started really slowly and then it grew. <laughs> but now I've got eight printers. So you actually took the opposite route. You went from business right. to enthusiast. Yes. As opposed to the other way around. Right. I always wanted a 3D printer. It just made it a really good excuse. Yeah. Yeah. You needed your use case. Yes. Barrett, how about you? Yeah, it was kind of the same for me. We started out wanting to do a business. We had an idea and that's why we bought the printer and just kind of shelved it as we were making stuff for ourselves. And other people are like, where'd you get that? Can I buy that? Where'd you get that? This is cool. And then it's like, well, where do we go? We looked at eBay. This seems kind of a mess. We didn't really want to go full e-commerce and spend a bunch of money on website and a lot of design. And that's where the Etsy shop came in. It was really easy to start and just threw some stuff up on Etsy and it really stuck quite quickly. From there, it was really more, well, I guess it started with consumer demand <clears throat> and then continued to be supported by demand. Yeah, definitely. Meredith, tell us a little bit more about your the 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 workings of your <clears throat> shop, the designing, the printers you're using, the materials you're using, and kind of the nuts and bolts of the thing. Okay, so it starts with the design, and I'll sketch it on my iPad, and then it goes into usually like Fusion 360, turns into the cutters that make the listings, and often I don't even make the 
um, my STL file until I've sold it. So it's, it makes it easy for me to just get out as many listings as possible because I want to be, I want to be the first on every search and I want to fill up the search results. So that's the goal. And um, yeah, from there. So once the purchase is made, I make the STL and I'll make it in all of the sizes because I offer about eight sizes per, um, per design. So everything is a print on demand. And then what kind of um, printers and material are you using for these? Uh, for printers, I am using uh, Prusas. I've got six Prusa um, MK3Ss, one mini, and I recently shelved an Ender uh, 3 Pro. So that was the first one. And for material, I am using uh, the Matter Hackers MH Build PLA. Awesome. Um, and you're using, um, like, do you use different, do you have like a signature color that you kind of use for your shop or are you using all different? Not colors? yet. I want to get to a signature color, but right now it's just kind of by the season. Sure. So in the fall, I, I try to use a lot of fall colors and so I kind of bounce around, but maybe one day. I have a question actually from the Q and A that I noticed. Um, how do you make them food safe? PLA is food safe. So it is a corn-based plastic. Um, it will biodegrade after a, a long period of time and it's not, you know, won't withstand the dishwasher, but it is marketed as food safe as that I've seen. And then of course, after you cut it, you do put it in the oven. So the main concern would be that bacteria could build up in the plastic if you're just not washing it well enough, but you are baking it after that. So you wouldn't want to use it in a nature cookie dough. That's a really good point. Cause that's, I mean, the, the, the material is safe, but the process is not so much because you do get those microscopic uh, gaps. But I could see mm -hmm. how, you know, if you're going to be uh, baking the item before you eat it or it's going to, you know, go in the microwave where everything isn't going to get burned out, then that could that could be a good workaround. Great. Um, Barrett, how about you? Tell us about your process. Yeah, I have three Preacher Mark threes. I have a mini and I have a fifth one. I couldn't even tell you the brand. This is a cheapo. Um, the Prusa Mark threes have been solid for me. The mini has been a little bit more problematic, but these have been just workhorses. I mean, this one, I'd have to look at, it has hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of days of print hours on it. And it just keeps going. And I barely do any maintenance, just clean it, lube it, and just keeps rolling. So I've been very happy with my Prusas. Uh, just bought another one recently and I use the Matter Hacker build series um buy it in bulk pretty happy with it awesome and tell us about <laughs> your kind of design process and uh... design process uh usually just calipers it's a little bit more precision part so use calipers and fusion 360 and design the part and um slice it do a couple prototypes make a few changes and then usually we're rocking and rolling and selling within a few days <laughs> Can you show us some of the parts that you um, that you sell? Yeah, we package them pretty nice, I think, but I'll show you kind of how they work. Because most people probably don't really have an espresso machine at home. And you use your porta filter and you put your coffee in here so it grinds into it. And on the prosumer machines, you usually get like two of these. So they end up in your drawer. They're annoying. Um, I swear every time I open it, these these spouts get hung up on the drawer and it's tearing it up. I'm like, I'm so tired of this in my way. So I made a wall rack and just clips in. They mount to the wall with a 3M command strip and just throw them up on the wall. A lot of people buy multiple. Um, like you can see some of them are bottomless, different styles. These are really popular, like aftermarket. People buy them for like aftermarket. So all of a sudden, they might even start with one they end up with like four and they're like man they're kind of in my way but i don't really want to get rid of them what do i do with them and everyone that's gotten it there they're usually like i don't know i didn't really think i needed this and then once i got it i about can't live without it because now i have like my back flush back flush for washing and this one that i don't use that often i'm using now so it, it's kind of a cool thing i think and the other one is for your tamper. So you like tamp your grounds down and we had demand for this. Hey, I want to put my tamper on the wall too, next to it. So whipped it out, 
we have a couple different styles, different sizes. This one fits two sizes. And just kind of evolved from there. And then random, my friend is in archery and you put, you put your paper targets on bales with like roofing nails. They literally buy roofing nails and it's like a piece of plastic with a big nail through it. And people, their fingers are bleeding and just made like a giant thumbtack. And we were selling like thousands of these things. I like, couldn't sell them fast enough. People were buying them in bulk and really simple, just utilitarian, kind of fun, make them different colors make all the gals like like the pink and the purple and the guys like some of the brighter colors are black we make like the military colors too so this that's that's i think what a 3d printer gives you the ability to do is i can take it take out one spool change it i even make different colors of these porta keepers and it gives a lot of options for customers that are like hey i want brown I want it to match the wood in my kitchen. I want white because I got a white backsplash. I want black because I want it to match my machine. So really simple, really opens up a lot of options for people. And that customization is really one of the reasons why 3D printing is the answer for yeah. Etsy shops, right? Like how would you, if, if 3D printers weren't a thing, how would you do this business? I would probably make something that doesn't look as nice out of wood. And it would take a lot longer. Like I start these when I go to work, before I go to work. Uh, I start them the second I get home. I start them after dinner. I start them before I put the kids to bed. And then I start them at bedtime. So just always keeping them going and giving all the different options for different people. There's like absolutely no way that I could be out in a shop like in my garage making these things nonstop. I got a wood. I just wouldn't be profitable. This is doing the work for me when I'm giving my kids a bath, making dinner, going to work and come home and I have essentially money sitting here. That's a good I'm point. Here. All right. <laughs> and then uh, what kind of materials are you using for these? I actually use ABS because when you take that out of the machine, they're actually really hot. Uh, some of them are machine stainless steel, some of them are brass, so they're designed to retain a lot of heat. They're designed to retain it for quite a long time. So when you hang it on the wall with like a PLA, you end up with this ring on the back and it's okay for prototypes because I can print them quick and cheap, but for the most part, it doesn't look as nice, I don't think, because you get a little bit more of the ridges, but it's much more utilitarian having the ABS high temp. It's easy to use. It really isn't that bad. There's a lot of people saying that ABS is really hard to print, and I almost prefer printing it. Maybe I'm just used to it. But yeah, someone in the chat actually just mentioned ASA, which is which is what I yeah. my my thought was. We're seeing a lot more people being interested in ASA for. for I thought about it definitely. <laughs> yeah, especially if it's something that maybe is going to be outside. Yeah. Um, ASA is a really, really good material. Um, PETG, do, PETG as well has been mentioned a little bit in the chat, but I think um, ASA or even like a high temp PLA. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's the nice thing about 3D printing now. And, and you know, people are like, well, what's the, the big innovation in 3D printers? I'm like, honestly, the materials, like the materials, materials are kind of, you know, like you've got, you know, companies like Ultimaker that are really pushing the envelope and you've got like the Pulse that has, you know, it can print composites like nylon and carbon fiber out of the box for like 1300 bucks. Like those are really, really good um, innovations. But really what's pushing the industry is the materials availability. Mm -hmm. um, awesome, Peter, tell us about your process. Um, so um, I designed my stuff on a, Fusion 360. Um, I also use a, a, a software called 3D Coat and uh, Blender. Um, what I usually do is I actually just make what I actually enjoy. So I like, you know, I like Star Wars. I like Marvel Comics, I like DC, I like video games. So I'll just make the stuff that other people like and I like. Um, so just example is the, the Loki show just started and I started watching it. So I made a 
you know, the Loki crown. So, and, you know, stuff like that. And uh, yeah, I did, I actually designed that all in Fusion 360. Um, it's all printed in uh, PLA. Um, I use, I use eSun PLA. Um, and I use only, I usually only use gray. And the reason why I use gray is because it photographs the best. Um, that's the only reason why I just use gray. Uh, most people will, will paint it. Um, like, so yeah, so like this is a 3D, this is how 3D print looks. And then this is what it'll look like after you finish it. So, you know, you just, you just can paint them up to whatever you want. Um, but yeah, we usually just sell them one color um, gray. Um, but that's, yeah, that's my process. Uh, I have, I have about 26 3D printers. Um, most of them are CR10 S's. I have two CR10 4S's and actually have uh, three resin printers. Um, so I, I have all the same, I have all the same CR10s because just having, when you have multiple printers, you want to keep them all the same. Uh, well, I feel like you should keep them all the same because printers will eventually break, they wear. So I just keep one set of parts, you know, just for one set of paper printers. Um, so, and they're very easy to work on. They're all opened up. Um, if, if space is not really a, that much of an issue, they're easy to work on because the boxes are broken out. So that's why I picked this CR10S. They're, they're very good machines and they're larger. So I need, I need one that's large enough to print a helmet in one piece. So, and they're a good size or, you know, 12 by 12 by, I forget the height, but it's 300, 300 by 400 millimeters. Um, um, but yeah, so I have most of them. Then I had the bigger ones just for, sometimes I print out like armor and stuff like that. I do special requests where people will ask me to design something for them and I design it for them. And sometimes it's armor, sometimes it's something a little bit larger than a helmet. Um, so, but then I've been uh, working on resin printers because the resin actually prints out smoother, much de more detail. Um, so I've been working on that. Um, and I've actually got um, the Phenom, uh, Phenom Palopoly, um, the... I guess the regular one and then the, the large one I have. I don't know what the, the smaller one's called, but they're both, the, the, even the small one can print a, a full mask and the larger one can actually put, print a whole helmet in one print. So, the and Moai, since, the what's Moai, that? The, it's, I think it's the Moai and the Phenom. Well, yeah, the Moai I think is the laser one. And I think oh. the Phenom is the um, um, LED one. And I, I actually had the laser one um, for a while, but um, it's just too small for what I need it for. So I got the, I got the two larger ones, um, but yeah, they, they're great. And the one thing that was holding me back was the price of resin, which much was real expensive. And that's since lowered um, in price and made it more reasonable to work with. Yeah, Tara is actually gonna put some um, uh, links in the chat of some of these machines and materials that we're talking about. So if anybody's interested, you can check it out. Um, I do want to talk more about, I was gonna kind of <laughs> ask everybody about the post-processing um, but there was a few things, Peter, since, since we're on you and you mentioned it, um, you, can you tell us how you sell your kits? Um, I think you had, you had mentioned like different sizes and then like that you actually empower others to do the finishing as opposed to doing it yourself. Yeah. So the, I guess the, one of the biggest benefits of the 3d printer is, um, I make all mine made to order according to head size. So what happens a lot of times you'll, you'll see a helmet that you like. You know, but unfortunately, they usually make the average head size, which is around, uh, you know, 23 or 24 um, inch circumference heads. Um, for us, we can make, you know, for someone who has a very large head or for kids or sometimes we can make it for like their pets, you know, like we can make any size. And the reason why we we um, we we don't paint them is is one we can it's we can. Um, produce it faster if we have the customers paint it. And the other thing is, which I, I, I noticed, which is a great thing, I feel, is I, I like doing the Comic Cons and I can spot some of the stuff that we've made and, and I see people painting it and make it their own. And, and, I, and they even when they when they have it and they're like, oh, yeah, this is my helmet. I made it. And and I feel like because they painted it and, and put all that work into it, it makes it more of theirs. And as is if we finished it completely, they might say, oh, yeah, this is a, a villainous prop shop helmet. They usually they say no. This is my helmet I made, you know, and I and that's why I like I enjoy that better more than than someone saying that, that you know they just bought it somewhere, and I, I do like seeing like one of my favorite things is seeing how people like put a spin on something like I'll I'll make a helmet a certain way and think of this is way and then someone will put a spin on it or they'll add something to it and and I'm like oh wow I never thought of that and you know that's the kind of stuff I really enjoy I mean I'm a super nerd so 
you know, that's just the scene helps and stuff like that. It's just why I like. I think that's so interesting though, because if you think about it, um, I think a lot of people that are thinking about doing Etsy shops, for example, especially for props and costumes, but even for anything, like they think that the 3D printed part is not enough to be a saleable uh, thing, you know, but like they have to do some finishing, they have to do some post-processing, they have to make it look like it's not 3D printed. But it sounds like all each of you really have your own kind of spin on why your customers <coughs> actually like just the 3D printed part. Like for you, it's almost like, you know, like old mo like model kits, like ship models or, you know, model kits that you would buy and paint yourself. Like that's the, that's what's great about it is that, like you said, you have ownership, you're kind of putting your own stamp on something. Is that right. what you're Yeah, because it's, it, yeah, because sometimes it's just, it's just like, if someone just wants one helmet, they're not like, for me, it was I wanted to buy a 3D printer, but you know, it's just like I just want the helmet. I, I can do the rest. You know, I don't have a 3D printer, but I can paint, and that's what they want, and that's what I, you know, I like to provide. Yep, yep. Meredith, how about you? What kind of post processing um, are you doing for your prints? So in the beginning, I, you know, you when you start working on your prints, you find that they have a lot of little strings, and I wanted to get rid of the strings, and I hadn't quite gotten my prints to the point to where they were good enough. Um, and I would take a lighter and I would try to just use the heat from the lighter to, you know, make the strings go away to frizz them off. And then, um, eventually I learned that I could use a hot air gun and it was a huge difference. I felt like a caveman using the, uh, the little lighter, but yeah, so I just hold it over the hot air gun and it works great. And I try not to do any more processing because I don't want them, you know, since it is going to be used on food, I try not to do much with them. Yeah. Barrett, how about you post-processing? Oh, we used to have to do like a lot of sanding, like it had like a sharp edge on the edge when we'd peel it off the build plate. And I didn't like the sharp edge or sometimes it'd be a little bit, a little bump sticking out. So got tired of sanding on the archery pins. We had a um, larger area that we would peel off and sand off and that ended up being a lot of work. So we actually just started putting like chamfers on it. So when you take it off, it's pretty much a finished product. There might be like a couple strings where it comes off the top and I usually just peel them off and they're clean. Sometimes I use a little file if there's like a bump, but it's not even noticeable. So um, not a whole lot, honestly. Most of us is packaging and shipping. Yeah. There's a question in the chat actually about print farm management, which is one of the things that I wanted to uh to talk to you all about. Um, so maybe uh, Barrett, since we can see your print farm there, can you tell us a bit about like um, just how you how you do um, print farm and production management, if there's any software or scheduling or kind of how you developed your system? I unfortunately don't really run any software. I actually did some Octoprint stuff and I had a printer that I ended up ruining. So I said, no more of this and I've just been scared to go back. <laughs> That's fair. That was about three years ago. So I, I've been thinking lately it might be worthwhile now that I have more printers, but I usually, usually start them manually. I got to clean them anyway. So how many parts about are you producing, um, say per week? Per week, about 80 to a hundred. Okay. So merely just a manual process at this point. Yeah. Okay. And then take a few minutes. Usually the worst part is changing filament. So do a little preheat and they're all different models and have different features on them. So some of them like this one's automated. This one's definitely not. That one's, that one has an issue with it. So it just depends. And then the minis, it's a little bit hard to change plastic on, I think. Mm. Cause you have a lot of jam. Meredith, how about you? Uh, I use, uh, I've got a Raspberry Pi attached to all of them and we 3d printed little camera cases to hold it and we run, uh, the octo print for them. Great. And how many and parts are you doing like uh, per week? About 200 to 250. Wow. All customized. <clears throat> all customized. Yep. Amazing. So like Running injection molding. All day. Yeah. Like injection molding is not like, is not a solution for this kind of business. You're not making that many of one part. It would be for the most popular, but overall in the large scale, probably not. Yeah. 
Yeah. And it's, it's really great because if something comes out and it's popular and it's all of a sudden I've got a client who needs something that's really random that her client wants. So I'm able to customize it really quickly. For example, I had a woman come to me and she needed some, um, some, uh, like cleaning products, you know, just those kind of shapes. And you can't just go on Amazon and find those. Yeah. Cause that's your business model is to do it customized. Right. Mm -hmm. Everything's yeah. customized. Yeah. Peter, how about you? What are your thoughts on um, print farm and then also your unique um, view on production? Um, so um, yeah, I, like I said, I have um, like 26 uh, 3D printers. Um, I, I just, I just use the SD cards. I don't have any networks because I've tried that before and I have had issues with, uh, you know, networks going down. So I just, I, I load everything up. Um, I use a, a slicer software called Simplify 3D. Um, and I just load up the cards and put them, I manually put it in the 3D printers. Um, my helmets take anywhere from, well, the masks and helmets take anywhere from one to like four days to print. And so I get out about, between 20 to 30 prints a week. Um, so it just takes a little longer. So I don't put out as much. And that's why I need more printers just to, to try to keep up with this, the demand. Um, usually my printers are always going. Uh, and, you know, they, if one's not going, I, I get paranoid. Like I'm like, oh, I'm losing money and I have to load it up. So I always have all my printers usually running. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I don't use any software except Simplify 3D to slice it and, and put it right, onto, right into the, the, the printer itself. And can you tell us a, a little bit about your um, the distributed manufacturing that you're doing? Uh, what, what do you mean exactly? Uh, you you had mentioned um, or uh, the you have a um, in order to meet the demand. Um, of oh oh yeah yeah so so yeah there's there's actually um, th uh, three other guys um, and what that one guy is in Arizona and then we have the uh, the other two guys are here in the East Coast. Um, and what we try to do, what we, we've been trying to do is, uh, the person in Arizona does the, the West coast stuff. And then we do the East coast stuff. And what we do is an Etsy, an order will come up and then a person will put their name on it and put on in progress. And then they'll take that print and then, and how, mm -hmm. how it works is the, the, the print they take, they get the money for it. So that's how it works. So they get a percentage of the money of that. So it's just whatever you can print is whatever you can, you know, is whatever you make. So. Mm -hmm. And it's been working well pretty uh, so far. Um, we've been able to keep up with demand. Uh, at times, especially around Halloween, it starts getting a little crazy um, trying to keep up with the demand. So, but yeah, we've been doing pretty good. Like I have over, yeah, I have over 25 printers. The one guy in Arizona, I think he has like around 15 printers. Um, the, the, the two guys here, they have between the both of them, they have like 10 printers. So we have a good amount of prints. Um, it does take a while to package everything. So that's, that's the, that's the part actually of all the things I hate, I hate packaging. So I'll wake up in the morning to start packaging and packaging and packaging. So once I get that done, it's a good day. <laughs> well, that was actually my next question. So that's a really good segue is uh, since we do have a lot of people uh, watching that are interested in potentially ha starting their own Etsy business, what are some things good or bad that you wish you knew going into this? Uh, that you now know that you can kind of offer? Uh, um, well, 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 for me, um, so uh, I, I would just, I just kept on buying different printers. Like I'd buy, I had, like I had several different, when I first started, I had several different printers and each of them had their own issues. Like, and I, and that's how I, I ended up getting just the CR 10 S is because I had, because I had, you no, know, I had all kinds of different printers and, and I'm saying one was bad and one was good. It's just, I had to keep up with all these different parts. I had direct drives. I had, I had Bowden systems, you know, I had ones with large nozzles, you know, long nozzles. And, and that's the thing is I had to keep all these parts. And as it was growing, I'm like, this is crazy. I have, I have to keep up with all this stuff. So I'm like, all right, I got to pick a printer that I like. And that's the printer. And that's what I did is I just picked a printer and I, and like, all right, now I can eliminate this part. I can eliminate this part, I can eliminate this part. And I picked the one that was popular because I wanted one that was easy to get parts. If you have one that's easy to get parts, it's cheaper, you know, because then there's no, there's nothing specific. And there's no specialized parts. So I got one that's pretty generic that you can get parts anywhere. This is so I can keep the price down for keeping up the parts. Because that's the thing is, you know, the printers are all the printers 
they have moving parts. They'll eventually break down, unfortunately, and you need to keep parts. And that's the thing you have to keep keep in mind is you want to keep on going because if the printer's not going, it's not making any money. So. Yep. How about you, Meredith? What are some things you wish you would have known? I wish I would have known that instead of using an inkjet printer, I could get a thermal printer to make my labels. And that has made a huge difference because I hate packaging. I spend hours on it every week. Uh, so I just, I love having the thermal printer. It's been great. And the other thing that I wish I knew, I wish I knew in the beginning how much into the machines I was really going to have to get into them. Uh, you know, you have to really take them all apart. And it really helped me learn the ins and outs of the machine. But yeah, I wasn't expecting that. Yep. How about you, Barrett? Yeah, I think for me, uh, just how much space it ended up taking up. I mean, one printer is on the edge. This used to be my little workbench, and now it's literally printing, shipping, uh, spread. You can't see it because I got the door closed. It's literally shipping supplies behind me for 10 feet. I mean, tons of shipping supplies, bubble wrap boxes, shipping envelopes. You buy them, you start buying them by like the thousand just because you don't want to pay for the little pack of 20 at the local place and you're paying all these crazy prices. I mean, if you're selling that volume, um, you, you end up buying all this stuff, tons of spools of filament. The filament takes up a lot of room. So I think just real estate in your home, um, if you're planning to grow, it's really kind of taken over my basement. Honestly. Yeah. And then I think the other thing that I think it's a double-edged sword because I'd say 99% of my customers are happy, but you always get a guy that like literally yesterday I got a guy, he wasn't upset, but he's like, man, my package arrived and it was torn and there was nothing in it. He was cool about it. I just shipped a new one. It's not a big deal, but you have some people that happens or like one guy got ran over by the mail truck and he was furious. I'm like, how is this my, <laughs> you end up like inheriting this issue that you've fulfilled your, your due diligence to this person. They've given you money, you gave them a product and it shows up damaged or lost or delayed. They're like, man, it's at the post office. Why do I have to pick it up? I don't know. So you get a few upset people, but I'd say for the most part, the almost like fanboys, people just, they love your product. You don't even know this person. They're like hashtagging you. They're promoting it on websites for you. And I think it's awesome. It's really been a community. Like I've sold to 70 countries and like I, I talked to guys in like Dubai. I talked to guys in Australia and New Zealand and China, uh, Poland. I mean, just go down the list. And these people are just like the best people. It's really opened up my eyes to the world. So I think that's kind of been a really cool thing for me personally. That's excellent. Yeah, things that you just don't think about when you're really don't starting think about business, that. especially starting a business online where like, you know, if you start a local shop in, you know, your town, like an in-person shop, you know, you, you get to, into your community and you get to know people. But when you're online, it's just all of a sudden your designs or your ideas are, you know, being are, are available everywhere, which is great. Not that's a good point because I live in Kansas and there's not many people here that have like an espresso machine in this town. No one has it. They just don't. And now I've said in like UK, obviously they have a lot of espresso over there and they're just constantly funneling them to the UK because you can actually reach your, your market having that Etsy shop. Or if I was brick and mortar, I couldn't do that. And anybody can do it. I um, I find it so funny. Um, so workforce development is something that I'm very passionate about. Um, you know, it's helping people to use 3D printers to become entrepreneurs, to start businesses, to bring into their existing businesses. Like we need to teach the next generation of kids to be able to run printers and to make designs and to like work for work for all of us. Um, I know we have some teachers that are that are attending today, and I just find I think it's so funny because sometimes I'll talk to uh, an elementary school teacher, for example, that has a 3D printer. They you know purchase a 3D printer for their classroom, and they're like, "Yeah, we're not really you know we just I have the kids go into Tinkercad and they just like design like a little cookie cutter or something. Like it's not really anything." And I'm like, "That's a job." Like no joke, any teacher that is bringing a 3D printer into the classroom and having the kids design 
anything that they are passionate about and then they can actually produce a thing that's that's the that's what we all need to hire that's the way that people actually as you can see teachers in the audience like this is this is the way to entrepreneurship this is the way to do product development and like you know go on shark tank and develop your idea um i know some of you as i, I think all of you have young young kids i'd love to just kind of hear for you know for the educators in the audience sort of what your experience has been with 3d printing and kids whoever wants to take it i'll start uh for me my daughter sees it and she just wants us to print more toys she loves it and it's, it's given her some more patience when she realizes that it's going to take eight hours to print her a new toy and also yeah. knowing that she can't print a new toy all the time because they're being used practically 100 percent of the time but she loves she loves it yeah i I've, I've been printing out my uh my my, my two boys halloween costumes so you know, they'll always ask for something and it's always, you know, this crazy thing I've never heard of. So I'm like, like what? So yeah, because they're always like the video game they're playing or something like that because I want to be that guy. So, you know, I'll look and I'm like, okay. And, you know, they'll have that. And, you know, the kids in school actually made a couple of costumes for the parents like, oh, that's really cool. So I've made a couple of costumes for their kids too. So that's cool my older daughter she's about five now she's gotten into this if she wants something she's like dad just go print it for me like she got a barbie and she was mad that the barbie didn't have a vacuum cleaner i'm like i really don't want to model a vacuum cleaner so i got on thingiverse couldn't find anything so i sat down for about an hour and designed it and printed out a vacuum cleaner and her barbie got a vacuum cleaner it was the right size right scale um she likes just random stuff. She was mad at Christmas. She wanted like a Barbie dream closet. And I just kept saying, no, 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 you're not getting it. It's Christmas time. And she's like, dad, just go print it for me then. So, I mean, it's in her head and she's just four. She's not even five yet. And she's already just like, go design it. Like, what's the holdup? Like, why isn't this on the printer yet for me? Uh, baby, she's a little bit younger, but she likes little stuff, print out little cats for her, like the Fab 365 cats that the legs move and the tails move. And we made um, SpaceX nerd over here. I like SpaceX. So I made the SpaceX capsule and um, printed out like the little spacemen and stuff for it. She just thought it was the coolest thing ever. So I, I really don't have much time to print stuff, like fun stuff, but every once in a while, yeah. She gets to squeeze something in. I have to add, uh, we had to print a, a Roomba for my daughter's dollhouse. That's what she wanted. Got out of the Roomba. Sounds like that could be its own Etsy shop if it doesn't uh, already exist. <laughs> be surprised all the ball, dollhouse yeah. stuff. So. Yeah. So I'm going to um, grab some questions from the chat, actually. Um, preferred slight, or not from the chat, sorry, from the Q&A. We are taking questions in the Q&A icon, uh, not the chat, because the chat disappears. Um, preferred slicers for everybody. Most of you have spoken about what design software you prefer. Um, matter Control, Simplify, what do we got? Well, uh, I, use, I use Simplify 3D. Um, and that's just because I, when I started, Simplify 3D was the best one out there. Um, but I do, I do feel like Cura is really good too. I started with Cura, and then eventually I moved to Prusa Slicer. It's the same for me, Pure, Cura, and then I just use Prusa Slicer. It used to have the slicer, just the regular slicer with Packard 3. And when they came out with the Prusa Slicer, it was, it was pretty legit. I was very happy. It's so quick and easy. You can do a lot with it. And do you, uh, does anyone incorporate 3D scanners into your prints, into your process? Not yet. I don't. I don't use a three D scanner. Yeah, I don't use a three D scanner. I don't either. I want to, but not for cookie cutters. Yeah, my parts are too precision. Like if it's even a thousandth off, it's too loose or too tight. So figuring out the shrinkage of the material and using some calipers. Just use I got like fifty or sixty dollar dial calipers from hardware store or wherever, and pretty easy to use. Another question here about um, pricing your parts. 
Um, how do you incorporate, how do you decide on pricing? Do you incorporate shipping costs? How does that all work? Well, for me, yeah, it's just, it's, yeah, the shipping costs, the material costs, electricity. And um, I, also I, I you look on the internet and see on, on Etsy and see, you know, if something similar price, am I out of the range? I do price my stuff to fail three times. So if, if I, I feel like, all right, if I fail three times, then I, I, I it's something wrong, but prints fail no matter how much you try so you're gonna have to especially for mine it's a long print you know you're gonna have to price to make sure I, this might fail so i price it as an as if it fails three times but yeah pricing is is difficult but there's a lot of costs you have to wrap into everything um but yeah the the time the time you save from just ha not have to put your hands on it is what makes makes it worthwhile to 3d print is because the the printer does the bulk of the work I price mine. Um, originally, I started pricing it off of what others were pricing it in the store on just on Etsy, and then I added. I decided I need to needed to find a way to also incorporate the cost of the uh, the, the box and the shipping materials. So I added a, um, a handling fee to go in for that. That way, I'm not having to pay for the box each time. <laughs> For me, I look at about how long it takes to print, but usually about 10 bucks an hour is what I average on a printer. Um, on a single item going out, I charge shipping. On multi-items, I get free shipping. Just because I feel like at that point, I'm they're, they're saving money on that anyway, and they're saving me money. So I can pass some of the savings along to the customers. But Definitely like the packaging stuff, like a box. If you go buy it from Amazon, just a standard box is like a dollar. It starts adding up when you're selling something fairly inexpensive, like 20 bucks or less, and you ate up half your profit just on shipping it. Don't be afraid. People will pay more than what you think, I'd say. That's a good tip. Yeah, it's kind of like the bulk, um, bulk filament from Matter Hackers. <laughs> And people are like, well, if I need to get it shipped in different places, can I still get the pulled price? It's like, no, it's the shipping, like shipping everything all at once is why we can, you know, get that, that efficiencies because it doesn't cost us as much. Um, but you know, people, people don't, um, unless you, unless you have your own shop, um, yeah. it's hard to really understand the, the costs that are involved in, you know, not just making something, but the shipping and the logistics and the boxes and the the um foam and the you know the the packaging that you need to get things to places safely it adds up i mean it can be hundreds of dollars like i bought 400 dollars of packaging stuff last week but it's a good problem to have if you look at it that way so yeah. come home every day and my wife has a new box of something random plastic <laughs> envelopes Another question from the chat, and um, because we started a little, we started about five minutes late, so we're going to go to about twelve oh five, and uh, and then we'll kind of call it, call it good. Um, does Etsy prevent others from copying or selling your designs, um, or do you need to pursue patents mm -hmm. for your designs? How does how does um, protection for your designs work? Etsy's horrible about it. I have a lot of impersonators. They use um meta tags with the name porta keeper in it so they when they search for porta keeper it pulls up their product i've actually had people buy my product reverse engineer it and sell it as a porta keeper uh i'd say your best bet over a patent because patents start at about ten thousand plus and they're very hard to uphold if you don't have a lot of money to really go after the person and they're usually small mom and pop getting a trademark it's usually like five six hundred dollars get a cease and desist letter, I told them to stop. And that actually will uphold with Etsy. But before I had that, Etsy's like, they wouldn't even return my call. They said, we really don't care, not our problem. You need to go take care of it with that person personally. So that was kind of a negative, I would say, dealing with them. Anybody else had experience with that or thoughts? I haven't. No. In my area, I find that a lot of people have designs that are really similar. So it's just kind of one of those, you know, make it cute, make it look good and hope that the customer picks you. 
take good pictures. That's when it helps to be a photographer. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I've had I've had some issues. Um, so a lot of times when I when you when I design my helmets, I can like you can't you can't design it exactly the same. So I can recognize my own design, and I I've I've reached out with Etsy and they've taken it down and they haven't had too many issues where people who who've copied my exact design or sell the file because I do I do allow people to sell like if I sell a file I do allow people to sell the 3D prints of it it's just when I design a file and then someone else puts buys that file and then starts selling the files when I I usually have an issue and, and they're, they're all like I guess I, I can tell exactly they're like my baby so I'm like oh that's my like because you know there's there's tons of the same mass and I'm like well that one's mine because I remember fretting for hours to get that eye shape and that is exactly you know the, you know that's exactly my model so and etsy's taken them down i have had any issues with them taking it down there was actually a question here um about the legalities of selling um uh like disney um you know pr uh, models but you're not <laughs> selling disney models you're making your own model how does that how do you navigate that world um so yeah there's definitely a, a legal issue um i a couple of my models were just they said they they infringed on their on their work whatever and i have had taken them down so yeah that's just that's definitely an issue you have to you know they they want their money um but i haven't had too many issues with, with a lot of like disney or the bigger ones the smaller companies are the ones i have issues i've had been having issues with um but the, the and it's uh, and it there's not many like there's not many people selling helmets. Like, um, I, this is just my idea. There's not many people selling helmets. So I don't think Disney really cares. They, I think they, they'd rather have the people going to the comic cons, wearing their stuff, you know, tell them like, Oh, this is great. This is where the money is from. It's just them enjoying going to the comic con and being their, the, the superhero they want. They realize that that's, that's where they're making their money. And this guy who's selling, you know, whatever, who's making that happen. It doesn't really affect them too much. Um, but yeah, you have to. Yeah, I, I looked into it. And it's it's thousands and thousands of dollars to 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 do that stuff. You know, to you know, if you want to make the exact or do the exact thing that they're doing, you have to spend thousands of dollars to get it. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, we. I mean, we design our own original stuff. I mean, we 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 design you know all kinds of. I mean, our, our own stuff. So it's not like yeah, all our stuff is you know. So we have our own stuff. Another question from the chat. Um, what are your favorite resources or communities for networking with 3D print other people that are 3D printing enthusiasts or other makers? Um, well, I, I do uh, Facebook and Instagram are the two I use a lot. Um, they, they, they're really good. Um, yeah, because there's tons of groups that, you know, that's all they do is 3D print um, cosplay stuff. So there's these groups that just do that. And and uh, Instagram's really well. I do really um, well in there talking to people. And the great thing about Instagram is I've, I've talked to people who are like designers on studios. I, I mean, I've talked to people who are designing costumes for Disney. And, you know, they just talk to you and they're just like, you know, they're super cool. You know, like they'll like check out my work and they'll give me uh, tips and information like, oh, yeah, you can do this. Try this or try this software. And, yeah, it's really it's really great. You know, it's really nice to be able to talk to these people. And, and, you know, without that social media, you could never ever talk to these kind of people who are in this industry. So, yeah. Hey, Tara, could you do me a favor? There is actually a question in the chat um, for uh, more information about the high temp materials that we had mentioned before. So um, ASA, high temp PLA and um, PETG that we were talking about before. Um, those were the materials that we recommend for, for more high temp. And Tar, if you could put those links in the chat, that'd be great. Um, let's see, any other um, online kind of how you're uh, interacting with the community? Yeah, um, I do Facebook and I found that I've had a lot of helpful Facebook groups, some that are just about your type of printer. And then I've got another group that's all about printing cookie cutters. So we, that's been really helpful. Can you show some of your cookie cutters? I know you've got them kind of yeah. in the background there, but, but uh, everybody else has done, done some show and tell. Here's one. This is a, a shark. We're going to make a set that's kind of a little uh, Jaws theme for 4th of July. Uh, we've got one that cuts out the teeth and one that doesn't. And that's, yeah. Cool. 
Nice. Barrett, anything for you for um, online communities? And I guess this could also dovetail, um, I know we always get uh, questions uh, from artists who are trying to transition into a business, marketing. Like I'm great at making yeah. stuff, but I'm just crap at marketing myself. Yeah. Maybe you can uh, tack a little bit of that in your- what Yeah, you're for doing sure. Uh, I've been really lucky on Facebook and Instagram, and it's been very interesting between the two, so. I would say Facebook, uh, my own personal page doesn't do that well on Facebook. It does amazing on Instagram. Uh, it's a little bit of the exact opposite with the archery stuff. So I don't know if it's just like the demographic of people that are into coffee versus archery and what they prefer. But I found that very interesting where uh, the majority of my followers are on one or the other, depending on the product. Uh, Facebook groups. So like an idea for Meredith is like maybe some cooking groups and just being in that community, showing off your stuff. Cause that's where I get a lot of my sales. Uh, a lot of my friends are in these espresso communities. Um, I'm an admin for espresso page and it just kind of happened by happenstance and it's really blown up. It's about 20,000 people now, extremely active community and I try not to push it on them, but I, I usually have people asking, where did, you, where did you get that? And they don't even really know it's me, and I just post the link and say, here you go. And um, it, It's a subtle way of advertising, <laughs> I guess you could say, if you have your product and your pictures. So following those more soft groups that aren't your, like, hey, how do you do this? How do you design this? Because that's what everyone's there to do. I like to focus on who's my audience of who's going to be buying this so that's been really helpful is facebook groups and then on instagram i have a whole bunch of different hashtags that i have to save to my phone so every day i'll be making a cup of coffee or i have a customer send me a picture of their setup and i have all the hashtags i find the one that seems to match their setup the best like their brand and stuff and i fill it up with a full 30 hashtags because you can do 30 hashtags and it doesn't matter if they follow Porta Keeper at all. If they're following Rocket Espresso, they're seeing it. If they're following just good on the list of all 30 of those hashtags is popping up on thousands of people's phones. You might not get that many likes, but if you run some of the back end uh, data, there's like tens of thousands of people that see it. And I find it really interesting on I I recently, I have Etsy as well, but I recently got Shopify as well. And it looks at about how many people look at your product before they commit to purchase. And it's about four times that they need to see it is what I'm seeing. So it's been really interesting. You got to get it in front of people, I think, to get the sales up. So that's my marketing scheme. Meredith, how about you? Is there a, is there a future coffee and cookie marketing <laughs> situation that I'm seeing here? I don't know. Um, for me, I find that Etsy's tags have been amazing and just using their own SEO. Uh, Etsy will market your ads. They'll do offsite ads for you and they will take, I think it's something like 12 to 15%, but only if it sells. So it can be in front of thousands of people and it doesn't matter. Even if they click on it, you're not going to be charged unless they buy it. So for me, I'm, I'm great with that. And I can't turn it off. Once you reach a certain point on Etsy, you don't have that choice anymore. Uh, and then just doing the keywords on Etsy has been great. And other than that, I do Instagram. I don't do ads. I just do hashtags. Yep. That's a good point on the SEO. Use a good SEO analyzer and use multi-words in your SEO, not single words. And that'll bump your score through the roof. Peter, anything for you? Marketing? Um, for me, it's just word of mouth. Uh, you know, I have, you know, people who will buy the stuff, um, the helmet, and they'll make up, they'll make their entire uh, costume out of it and post it up on Facebook or Instagram. And then they'll ask where they get that from. And, it'll, you know, it's just word of mouth. Um, the one thing I did notice on Etsy is you have to, you have to be, um, I guess, uh, um, on the top. You have to be the one to put it out first. Um, what happens is 
if you have something good and people will see it, they'll they'll make it and then they'll lower the price because they feel like that's the only way they feel like that's the only way they can sell more than you is lower the price. And I've seen it where they lower the price where they're not even making money afterwards. Oh. And I feel like the way to, to keep on Etsy is you have to keep on you have to keep on being fresh. You have to keep on putting new stuff up. You have to keep on being the you know the first one to do it. Um, it's important because yeah, we're dealing and Etsy you're dealing with a lot of artists who don't have maybe a, a, a marketing background. So they feel like the only way to compete is to lower the price, even though you thought, Oh, I, I figured out this is how much it costs. And you are at the point where this is how much it needs to be to make money. They might not think that way. They're like, Oh, well I can go below and below. And then after a while, it's just, it's just people out pricing each other and putting that, that particular thing out of, out of, you know, out of profitability. So the, the thing is, is to keep, you know, to keep fresh and, and to keep on putting stuff out there. Um, and like, the, like they both said, um, hashtags on Inst- Instagram are free and they work great. And the, the search words on Etsy are great. Um, you know, you ha- I, I met, one time made a mistake and I forgot to put them down. And I'm like, why am I not getting any hits on this? Everybody wanted it. And I looked at my, and I'm like, oh, I forgot to put the, the search in there. And then once I did that, it started searching. So they're really important as the keyword searches and stuff like that. Mm. One thing I did that uh, has helped on my, I've got a little thank you card I put in there in my package and I'd make sure to put my Instagram tag in there. That way people can tag me. And I have found that that has been really helpful. And then I can use their posts in my own stories and on my Instagram. And that's been huge. I do that. And then I also email them. You can send them a message and I just copy paste my last one and I'll go through 50 or 60 and I might get three or four reviews, but that's three or four reviews and that, that helps a ton. And then you get someone excited. They're like, Oh man, I didn't know you had Instagram. They send you pictures. So it's a little bit manual. It's not automated on Etsy, at least as far as I've been able to find, but it doesn't take 10 minutes to do. Excellent. Well, we are about, well, we're, we're a bit over time, but we are definitely at time. I'd still love to just go through one more quick round. Anything, any closing remarks, anything you'd like people to know about, uh, you know, if they're interested in starting their own 3D printing Etsy shop. Meredith, why don't we start with you? Okay. Um, I guess with Etsy, you can start small. The overhead is really small. You're not going to, I think you have to pay 20 cents for each listen you get out there. So you're really not going to lose money just by trying it out. And Barrett? I'd say if you got a printer and you have a product, I'd get on and just list it. I mean, it's free to start. Um, If you're wanting to grow big, maybe start up like with a a DBA account with your, your bank, keep your funds separate and you can fund your business much easier. I didn't do that. I had it all as one. Got a little bit more interesting later, but I just tell people like I have a friend not 3D printing, and I'm like, just go start it. It takes 10 minutes to start. Take some pictures with your phone, and you're literally in business. Just do it. Don't be scared. I, I think a lot of people are scared. Great advice. How about you, Peter? Um, I guess I, I my advice is just pick something that you enjoy that you love. Um, I always feel like you can't, you can't compete against someone who is doing something just for money against someone who's doing it because they enjoy it. Um, I enjoy making the helmets. It's not just, just for, you know, just for money. And, you know, it, just pick something that you enjoy. Like even if, you, even if it's like, oh, well, I don't know if I can make, you know, stuff for archery. Well, you know, you, you, you had to figure it out, you know, it, yeah. it, you, you know what, you know, what needs to be done. You love archery. You, you do it. And you figure out what the need is. And the thing is, you can't compete with someone who loves doing something like that. Yep, I would agree. If you have a passion for something, and that's exactly, you know, if you got a passion for something, you want to try and turn it into profit, doesn't work as well the other way around. You got to start with that passion. That's what, that's what I do right. personally working for Matter Hackers. That's what Matter Hackers does, you know, for our customers. We all have a passion for 3D printing and having people be successful with their businesses. And, uh, and that's got to be how it starts. Thank you so much, all of you, for taking time out of your busy summer to uh, to share this inspiration with us. Thank you to everybody that's been in the chat and that's been asking questions. 
We absolutely will be emailing out the link to this video so you can watch it for reference and um, keep an eye on uh, matterhackers.com slash events for more virtual and hopefully pretty soon in person inspiration sessions and, uh, and events. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Hi, thank you.